I'm John and I too play a guitar. Sometimes I play the fool. I was raised by my auntie. My father and my mother split when I was about four. I spent some time with mother up till about four. Then I was brought up by an auntie. I spent some time with mother up till about four. Then my father split. He was a merchant seaman, you know, you can imagine, in, and it was 1940s in the war and all that. Prof and roll meant it was real. Everything else was unreal. To me, it got through. It was the only thing that, to get through to me out of all the things that were happening when I was 15. Well, there was no such thing as an English record. You know? I think the first English record that was anywhere near anything was Move It by Cliff Richard. And before that, there'd be nothing. When I went to art school, I was at art school for five years. When I went to, this was sort of college, you know, I went in there, they would only allow jazz to be played. You know, they wouldn't allow rock and roll in, it was frowned upon those days. So we had to con them into letting us play rock and roll there on the record player by calling it blues, you know. When I was 16, Elvis is what was happening. A guy with long, greasy hair, wiggling his ass and singing Hound Dog and uh, That's All Right Mama and those early Sun records, which I think are his great period. You know, you went to see those movies with Elvis or somebody in it when, when we were still in Liverpool, and you'd see everybody waiting to see him, right? And I'd be waiting there too. And they'd all scream when he came on the screen. Right? So we thought, that's a good job. And then when I was 16, I re-established a relationship with my mother for about four years. She taught me music. She first of all taught me the banjo, and from that I progressed to guitar. She, the first song I learned was Ain't That a Shame, an old rock hit, Fast Domino. I had not no idea about doing music as a way of life until rock and roll hit me. And then when rock and roll hit me, that changed my whole life. It's a joke in the family. Guitar is all right for a hobby, but it won't earn you any money. I never considered doing, being a musician in, in, in a considered way, you see. I've never taken anything that considered. I was, I had it, a lot of balls in the air, you know, and when I, I became a professional musician the day I got a red letter from the art, art college saying, don't bother coming back next September. Now I'm a professional musician. Oh, met me the first day I did Bebop a little alive on stage. And a, a mutual friend brought him to see my group called the Quarrymen. And we met and we talked after the show. And I, I saw he had talent and he was playing guitar backstage and doing 20 Flight Rock by Eddie Cochran. I was the singer and the leader. But I made the decision whether to have him in the group or not. Was it better to have a, a guy who was better than the people I had in, obviously, or not? And that decision was to let Paul in to make the group stronger. And I turned around to him right then on first meeting and said, do you want to join the group? And I think he said yes the next day. The first thing we ever recorded was That'll Be The Day. Buddy Holly song. And one of Paul's called uh, In Spite Of All The Danger. I had a vision when I was 12 and I saw a man on a flaming pie and he said, you are Beatles with an A and we are. When they were depressed, or oh, we're all depressed, you know, thinking that the group is going nowhere and this is a shitty deal and we're in a shitty dressing room, I'd say, where are we going, fellas? And they go, to the top, Johnny, in pseudo-American voices. And I'd say, where's that, fellas? And they'd say, to the topmost, the poppermost. I'd say, right. And then we'd all sort of cheer up. George had done little of the, uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in the studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. You can be big-headed and say, yeah, we're going to last 10 years. But as soon as you've said that, you think, you know, we're lucky if we last three months. Oh, and the water could be happy just to love you. First of all, it was making it big in Liverpool and then being the best group in the, in the county, you know, then being the best group in England, and then we got to Scotland and break them in and things like that. And your goal is always, a, you know, just a few yards ahead rather than right up there. We were the first working class singers that stayed working class and pronounced it. Didn't try and change our accents, which in England are look, were looked down upon, probably still are. 
And it was great, you know, we were kings and we were all... John, so far, all British pop stars have not made a tremendous impact on the States. How do you think you're going to fare? Well, I can't really say, can I? I mean, is it up to me? No. I mean, I just hope we go all right, you know. But nobody others were made it in America. We were dying to be the first. But on stage, I was, I always feel safe even when they break through. I don't know, it must be some kind of, you know, I just feel as though I'm all right when, when I'm plugged in and I don't feel as though they get me. Hello. Hello. Oh, wait a minute. Don't no, I'm not. Oh, you are. I'm not. Oh, you are. I know you are. I'm not, no. You don't look like him at all. The quote which John Lennon made to a London columnist more than three months ago has been quoted and represented entirely out of context. If it had said we're more, uh, television is more popular than Jesus, I might have got away with it. I just said they are, are having more, in, more influence on kids and things than anything else, including Jesus. But I said it in that way. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down. I was just saying it as a fact. And it sort of, it is true, especially more for England than here. You know, I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong or was taken wrong and now it's all this. Into these troughs every few years, it was less noticeable in the Beatles because the Beatles' image and thing would carry you through it, you know. I mean, I, I was in the middle of a trough in help, you know. But uh, you can't see it really. I mean, I'm, sing I'm singing "Help" for a kickoff, you know. And but it was less noticeable because you you're protected by the the image of the power of the Beatles. Oh. Oh. We might have been waxworks for all for half you know, what the good we did there. You know, nobody heard anything, or not even, you know, a basic beat, I don't think. They were too busy tearing each other up. Uh, as a Beatle, we made it, and there was nothing to do. You know, we had money, we had uh, fame and there was no joy, you know. And then I met Yoko, and she was making it as an avant-garde artist, and uh, we both tried to find something we had in common, a common goal in life, because we couldn't, she couldn't rock and roll with me, and I couldn't avant-garde with her. I mean, we can, but that's what we thought at the time. So we decided the thing we had in common was love, and from love came peace. So we decided to work for world peace. Everybody seemed to be paranoid, except for us two who were in the glow of love. You know, everything's clear and open when you're in love, and everybody sort of was tense around us, and, you know, what, what is she doing here at the session, or why is she with him, and all this sort of madness is going on around us, because we just happen to be want to be together all the time. Eh? The whole pressure of it finally got to us. So instead of, you know, like people do when they're together, they start picking on each other. You know, it was like, it's because of you, you'd got the tambourine wrong that my whole life is a misery. You know, it became petty, but the manifestations were on each other because we were the only ones we had. It takes a lot to live with four people over and over for years and years, which is what we did. And we'd call each other every name under the sun. We'd got to blows. We'd been through the whole damn show. We knew where we were at, we still do. We've been through the mill together for more than 10 years. You know. We've been through our therapy together many times, you know. And we got to let it be. We couldn't play the game anymore. We couldn't do it anymore. It's come to a point where it was no longer creating magic. And the camera sort of being in the room with us made us aware of that, that it was a phony situation. It's natural, it's not a great disaster. People keep talking about it as if it's the end of the earth. It's only a rock group that split up. 
It's nothing important. You know, you have all the old records there if you want to reminisce. I think our old our society is run by insane people for insane objects, mm. objectives. But now I can put it into that sentence that I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal mean uh, ends, you know. If, if anybody can put on paper what our government and the American government, etc., and the Russian, Chinese, what they are actually trying to do, you know, and how, what they think they're doing, mm. I'd be very pleased to know what they think they're doing. I think they're all insane. You know, but I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. And every country's had a violent revolution for one reason or the other. Not one of them has the freedom we're all talking about. So we're saying give peace a chance, you know, like nobody's ever done it before. And it's not a matter of... We're not thinking in terms of ten years. We're thinking in terms of peace forever, you know. And that everybody's talking about now. I want peace now. We can get peace now if we want it now. And the left wing talk about giving the power to the people, you know. Anybody knows that the people have the power. All we have to do is awaken the power in the people. The people are unaware. It's like they're not educated to realize that they have power. They put the politicians in power. They vote for the local mayor. The people do it. But the system is so geared that everybody believes that just the father will fix everything, the father being the government. Government will fix everything. It is all government's fault. You know, bad, shake your fist of the government. Well, we are the government. The people are the government, and the people have the power, but we must try and make them aware of this. And then I, I came over to America and just, with no particular decision, decided that I'd like to live here. It was, uh, it was harder to stop than to continue, although I don't think continuing would have done me any good, well, artistically, but... It was, it's, it's very hard to tell. I kept thinking this must be what it's like when guys get retired at 65 and they're still alive and kicking, but somebody pushed the button and they have to go. So I kind of dealt with that, you know, what would one do if what, one wasn't doing it? And uh, gradually I got into being a household member with Sean or whatever. For at first I was very sort of frantic all the time, didn't know what to do, you know, it seemed to be endless time, you know. I enjoyed being housebound because I'm, I always liked hanging around the house, you know, I mean, writing music is hanging around the house. And the only difference was I wasn't writing music, I was writing uh, menus, right? You see, having gone through the Beatlemania thing, nowadays it's nothing like that. I mean, I can walk down the street and somebody will say, oh, hi, John, and they usually say, hey, you're immigration, you know, if it's in New York, right? And they don't hassle me. I might sign one autograph, two autographs, you know? And I don't get hassled. And I went through that period where I actually couldn't go anywhere. And so now it's like, hey, I can go and eat. We go and eat. We go to the movies. We go wherever we want. If I, if I was dead, they wouldn't be angry at me. If I'd conveniently died in the, in the mid-70s after a rock and roll album or Walls and Bridges and they'd all be writing this worshipful stuff about what a great guy and... You know, and wasn't he funny with a tampax on his head? You know, all that stuff, like, it's all right when you're dead, you see. And they'd all be saying, oh, what a great guy, and wonderful, wonderful, and that. But I didn't die, so that infuriated everybody that I would live and uh, do, do what I want to do, you know, which is look after me and the family. That was the central concern, to be a family. And not live as that was more important than creation and records, rock and roll and being in billboard. Thank you.